listening to the Unshackle Your Life podcast with Debbie Colburn. And each week, we talk all things money, business, personal growth. And we dive deep, exploring the hundreds of things that shackle us unconsciously from our own true potential. And you'll discover tips and tactics to start unlocking your shackles and release an extraordinary life. Thanks for spending time with me today, and let's dive right in. So hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Unshackle Your Life podcast. Today, I'm joined by someone who would say was living every little boy's dream, a special agent with the FBI, taking down the bad guys, Mexican cartels, gangs, and saving people from horrible endings. You name it a life coach and behavioral analysis expert, Roman Garcia. Roman, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's an honor. I'm really, really excited to talk to you today because your story is literally going to blow some people's minds. What you've been through and how you come out is pretty incredible. But I know that despite what sounds like a perfect career path, you are holding a secret of your own that led you to become a life coach. So I'd like you to walk through people people through your story and I'll ask the listeners to keep this question top of mind. Does one bad choice define us forever? So let's have it with the story. And I know this is an amazing story. Let her rip, huh? Okay. Let her rip. Um, my story, I, I guess I'll start from high school. I was, uh, I struggled through high school. I was, or through all school, um, I didn't read well. I thought I was, I was overwhelmed with all my classes. I never got good grades. I went to junior college. I wanted to become a respiratory therapist initially because I thought I could get done with school and have a job and um, not worry about going to a lot of college, but I didn't, I didn't take that path. I was a, a ski patroller. I loved adventure. I was, uh, worked for an ambulance company And then I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when I was 19. A friend of mine, some friends introduced me to it. Um, I got to go on a mission for two years to Mexico City. That was amazing. When I came home, I followed a girl to Utah. And um, I quickly found out that I needed to go to college because I didn't have any other skills to sustain me. And I wasn't good enough at playing the guitar. So I went to try to get into BYU. I was rejected four times, I think. And they finally let me in at some point. Um, I finished a degree. It was the hardest thing I ever did. And I got a job as a facilities manager. Um, that was an okay job, but I wanted more. So I pursued an MBA. At some, at some point during this time, I realized someone gave me a test and they said I had dyslexia, which I already knew I had dyslexia because I'd always mix up numbers and stuff and explained why I was not very good at reading. And um, uh, I think my ADD drew, drew, uh, drew me towards jobs like working for the um, you know, ambulance company. As I was completing my MBA, I got an email um, suggesting I apply for the FBI and it was a headhunting company. And so I applied and I kind of just dismissed it a little bit and um, somehow I got into the FBI. So they let me in and I went to Quantico, Virginia to the FBI training academy. It was like a small college where they teach how to shoot guns and fight as well as other, other stuff. It was pretty interesting. Um, after graduating from the academy, I was sent to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, I worked um, public corruption matters, and I worked Mexican drug cartels, and then counterterrorism. Later on, I transferred to Salt Lake City, where I worked public corruption and counterterrorism as well. And during my career in the FBI, I was a tactical EMT, which is basically a combat medic. And I was in charge of going to um, operations with like the dive team or the SWAT team or the bomb squad where there was high risk. And I was there to treat casualties if they came, came about. So as a tactical EMT, I was on a lot of SWAT operations with the SWAT team. Um, it was very high frequency in, in uh, Los Angeles. We were out maybe once or twice a week uh, and during some years. It was, it was very frequent. Um, I was on the ground 
at the San Bernardino shootings while they were going on. We were called out and then we staged and then we had a lot of jobs to do during the San Bernardino shootings. I was called to other um, active shooter situations like at UCLA, LAX, and uh, I staged for the Santa Monica College one too. Um, so it was, it was, it was kind of, um, it was pretty interesting. So, so that's the successful stuff that people like to hear, you know? Um, yeah, aside, that's, the cra that's the crazy stuff, right? Yeah. So aside from my um, professional life, the, I think what defines me most are the mistakes and failures I've had, you know, and the, and the setbacks. So the reason I'm here is because of those things. I identified uh, with having a pornography addiction when, um, from early on, you know, I, I enjoyed it um, when I was a little boy. Uh, and, uh, and then when I became a member of my church or, and married, it was something that caused me a lot of shame and guilt and, um, couldn't really, um, it, you know, just shame, guilt, isolation, stuff like that. Ultimately I decided I made a choice to have an extramarital affair and it was kind of the kill shot to my marriage. I kind of wanted to end it somehow. I wasn't sure how, I guess. I'm not sure. I don't know the psychology fully about it, but I made that choice <clears throat> during the course of this, uh, the go what, when this was going on. During this, what we were going through, my ex-wife wanted to go stay with her parents, which was natural. And um, she said she would go and then and leave the state for a couple months and then come back when this was resolved. And then when she got there, couple months in, she sent me a message stating from her lawyer stating that she's never coming back. And um, I was new in my career, fought it. And basically, I lost my children at that point. Um, I, I looked at it as kind of like a legalized kidnapping. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me, losing my that's children. Kind of a, that's kind of a kick to the nuts, right? Yeah. I mean, it's um, so uh, there's uh, and not only I mean, it was a it was a war. In, in, you know, there, there was a battle and she won, she, she won that battle. She, um, she turned people against me and, you know, made sure everyone knew what happened and stuff. And she was hurt. So she, um, did felt there was hurtful things done on top of all this stuff. So anyways, um, it was, it was, uh, it was the worst. It was the worst thing. The separation from my kids was the most devastating thing that happened to me. And then so I stayed with this girl who I had had an affair with and she had kids and then she became pregnant and then we had a child together. And so when my older children would come visit, they would come, you know, on the three day weekends, very limited, like a few days a month. My uh, new relationship, who we eventually got married, my new wife, was not tolerant of my relationship with my older kids. So I felt like I had two women working against me, having a relationship with my children. And wow. it, it, was, it was chaotic. <laughs> and um, it was, yeah, it really screwed me up for a long time. I felt isolated. I felt sad. I felt angry. I couldn't function. I, I was depressed. I would cry a lot. And it was it was like I put my hand in a bear trap and I couldn't figure out how to release myself, you know, like it was, um, it was the worst. And, and you was, were still, you were still going to work at the FBI putting on this yes. facade of being real tough. Yeah. FBI. I mean, I, I'm never tough. If you compare me to other people, I'm not the toughest or biggest <laughs> or strongest or anything, but yeah, I would go to work and just be the shell of a person. So that kind of uh, taught me a lot about what people go through. People, you know, you go to Starbucks and you're in line and I feel there's people there who don't wanna live the rest of the week or there's people who don't know how to pay their mortgage or there's people who don't, they're, they're battling an addiction or something like that. So all around us, there's people who are suffering, but that was my affliction. I felt um, stunned and I felt, helpless and I didn't know how to find a way out. Like I said, I went to therapy for a decade. I did a 12 um, step addiction recovery program, which helped me out a lot. Um, I went to church every week. I prayed. Um, I sought, I was seeking. I, I, I remember just coming home every day and sitting on the edge of my bed after, you know, unloading my weapon, you know, putting my weapon in the, um, in the safe and 
taking off my all the stuff that I carried, handcuffs and ammo and badge and stuff like that, and just sitting there thinking, this is never going to end. This is never going to end. And I and I remember the pain of being separated from my older children, and I I didn't want that pain to end. I wanted it to stay in me to motivate me to change and to get close to them and to to establish a relationship with them again so that's what I so said. this was so your second wife she's the one with the borderline personality disorder is that correct allegedly yes allegedly <laughs> yeah it's it's we we know but we don't nobody wants to really really admit it but the fbi wasn't helpful to you if i recall they they made life really hard for you towards the end right well, yes. So um, the FBI has an organization called EAP, Employee Assistance Program. So they have counselors and stuff like that. And so, uh, yeah, the end of the story is I came to, um, so, well, not the end of the story. One milestone is I came to Salt Lake City. It seemed to me that, you know, coming from California, like I said, San Bernardino shootings, Mexican drug cartels, you know, Sinaloa stuff, like there is stuff that's I was part of takedowns and uh, operations that are in have gone down in history, you know. Not that I'm the the one doing it. I'm part of you know a group part of, of a team. agents or whatever. Yeah. But coming to Salt Lake, there's not as much terrorism as you could imagine. There's not as much counter and you know uh, espionage or cartels. I mean, there's still bad stuff that happens, but it seems like the office was filled with people looking to justify their existence or whatever. So I was singled out and people decided they wanted to try to fire me. And so I thought, no way they could fire me. This is whatever, you know, like I was put on a probationary 90 day thing. And I was like, okay, well, I don't have any other skills besides being an FBI agent. I don't, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an engineer. I can't just fall back and like get some cushy job or whatever. So I need this job. I'm a single dad. I have two little boys that I'm taking care of. Plus my older two kids. It was, you know, it was a wake up call for me to like, you know, so I was doing my best. And one thing that you'll know about me when you do some research, I'm not the best agent you'll ever meet. Uh, by far, I'm not the best, but I am 100%, a thousand percent, not the worst agent you'll ever meet. And I did not deserve to be let go, but I was let go. Um, I fought it. I went to Washington, D.C. I hired a lawyer from New York. He and I went up there and went line by line to to go over everything. But it turned out that they weren't as, uh, you know, they weren't what I thought they were. <laughs> they weren't the yeah. brand I thought they were. And so they let me go. And that was um, humiliating. That was, uh, you know, I lost my pension. I lost my you know, it, it was, it was hard. Uh, and I was, I, I saw the writing on the wall long before. And I, and I tried, I, I was trying to, I, I, at this point I had started transitioning into learning about life coaching. So I really, and with my religion and everything, I'm Christian. And um, I knew that bad things happen to good people, you know, like bad, bad things happen and it's just part of life. And hopefully someday it all works out and it all has meaning and we all get better from it. So I left. Since then, I've become a, uh, a private investigator working with people. And it was uncanny, but I started running into men in the same situations that I was in. People like in very bad relationship situations that needed help, that, you know, successful, handsome, educated men that were just brought to their knees by some custody issue or something that, you know, their wife tried to get them arrested or something like that, like really, really bad things. And so anyways, I uh, did that. And then I was able to become a certified life coach. I had always had an interest in psychology through the decade of therapy that I put myself through and the, the mess that I was, and I felt like I wanted to reach out. The life coaching seemed a lot different than therapy. It was kind of like actionable instead of just talking about my problems, they didn't really care about my problems or my past. They said, hey, this is where you're at now. What are you gonna do in the next 24 hours to make yourself feel better? And it was like actual things I can do, steps I can take and ways to manage my mind to change everything. So it's kind of like steered my ship to a whole different destination. So now I feel like I've found an answer and it just took a short amount of time. So as a life coach, now I work with people and I tell them like, I can show you in about three weeks, 
what it took me more than a decade to find. And a lot of us have this burden that we're carrying. You know, I'll go through the list and try not to repeat it over and over, but you know, <laughs> there's obesity, you know, there's diabetes, there's anxiety, there's fear, depression, dysfunctional relationships, there's smoking, there's drug addiction, there's, um, you know, sitting on your phone too much addiction to Netflix or pornography. I mean, we all have them. Like if we just take a second and say, what's, if I could get rid of one burden in my life, what would it be? And we all have those things. And some of them are really holding us back. It, they're holding us back from making money. They're holding us. I mean, that's just the, the measurable one, money. You know, what could I do if I earned 10,000 more a year or doubled my income? Right. That's measurable. But you can't really measure. Like I wake up every day. So you, know, the, you can't really measure the fact that someone wakes up every day with this pit of fear in their stomach. And I had that. So I know you can't really say this is, I, I would pay this amount to remove it, but it's once it's gone, it's like, Oh my gosh, I was living with that every day for three decades or whatever, or I didn't get along with my spouse for this, however long we've been married or I, you know, all these things. So it's just amazing. Like we can manage our mind a little bit, get different. Okay. Ways. So let's, let's dive into that. Uh, let's dive into that a little bit. The thing is with, with men in particular is they don't call it. I have a pit in my stomach that makes me feel awful. Or they don't call it shame. They call it. I'm letting my family down. You've talked about it with your, your kids. I don't have enough time. They have a different terminology for it, Yeah. but Right out of the gate, I actually want to talk to you about dyslexia yes. because my son suffers from dyslexia and there's a whole generation of people who are around your age, the sort of born in the early, somewhere in the range from the early to mid 70s to the mid 90s. There's a 20 year block of generation that got missed in dyslexia. They just, they had to muddle their way through school and it, it leaves you with, can you describe, there, there's a level of shame that, that yes. dyslexia makes you feel. Well, I was always the slowest reader in class. I remember like my friends, I, they would read and they would be able to read quick and stuff. And I always, I, I always felt like an idiot. And I remember this the pretty girl in my class when I was in third grade, she could read really well. And I always like, Whoa, she's awesome. Like, what would it be like? And I just always avoided reading. I, cause I hated it and I couldn't read well and I didn't know why. And it was, um, and my parents didn't pick up on it. So, you know, I just w w went with it. One thing I do know, cause my little boy had it. Um, so, um, we would read and, you know, like half hour homework that he was supposed to have, it would take us like two hours and I, and I was determined as a dad, like I, I said, Hey, you and I have to work harder than most people, but we're going to do it. And he didn't like yeah. it and it wasn't fun. You know, it was like boot camp every day. So we recognized it and I told his teachers and of course the teacher's like, Oh, he doesn't have dyslexia, but we don't even test for dyslexia. So it's like, why are you telling me he doesn't have something you don't even test for? You know, I know what he has. And you know, like he would say like, dog would be God or something like that. He would just read it backwards, like right off the bat. So I knew he was just looking at like the way I do. And so we went to a dyslexia center and we spent the time and a lot of prayers and a lot of patience. And now that little boy, that little boy has read more in his life than I've read in mine. And he's 11 years old. It's, it's amazing. And so, and he, it, it, like the miracle is seeing him on the couch, just looking at a book and reading it, you know, like he's read all these, all, the, all kinds of books and it's, it's, yeah. it's so grateful. So there's, that's fantastic because I know exactly what you're talking about. And I, yeah. I jokingly say I read dyslexic because yeah. I was that parent, same as, same as you with the, with the child that was dyslexic. And I remember saying over and over to, to my, to my mother, he doesn't need to learn how to write because technology will catch up so that he'll be able to dictate his stuff and it'll just translate oh, nice. it. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what, what happened. Wow. But did you have a, did, did no one stepped in for you? There wasn't a teacher that identified it 
Yeah. That's I mean, someone, someone gave me a test one time. I said, oh, because I asked them, do I have dyslexia? Then they gave me some little test and they said, yeah, you have dyslexia. So, I mean, it wasn't a formal thing, but I knew I knew what I had. Like I would mix up numbers and mix up license, like at the FBI, I'd mix up license plates all the time. And they're like, do you yeah. have dyslexia? One guy asked me one time, do you have dyslexia? I'm like, uh, yeah. And then he's like, you totally screwed up that <laughs> license plate. But um, yeah, I think the thing with your son and with me or with anyone who has dyslexia, it's kind of like, any d disability like you ha there's um there you compensate with other skills you know like you spend more time looking at something or whatever or you you adapt and you we have to survive you know we have to be able to order a pizza or whatever we or you know get food or have a job we have to function so yep. we coping mechanisms you end up with coping mechanisms yeah, like and that's why entrepreneurship is so good for that richard branson is dyslexic so dyslexic Bill Gates wow. is dyslexic. All these guys, these high performers are dyslexic because it allowed them to, to capitalize on the things that they normally wouldn't use and you know find resources that, that fill in the spaces. And then, so tell me about your boys, because obviously being a father is super, a good father is a super important to you. Yes. What ages are they now? So I have four children. So the children from my first marriage are 22 years old and 18 years old. And my, my daughter, she, she's 22 and then three boys. So my daughter is, um, she's pursuing a degree in psychology and working with people. I think part of her trauma, her post-traumatic growth was from, is working with people and helping them through situations that she's gone through, you know, as losing her dad or whatever, or the separation. Um, my son is going to college now. He's starting at the University of Utah. And then I have two little boys. They're 11 and nine years old. And they're, I just, I love them. I love all of them. And I don't want to lose my two little ones. My older ones, they've become alienated tor towards me, from me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think they've heard a lot of things that I did wrong or um, a lot of opinions or whatever. And so um, I think just the whole realm of parental alienation, I, I knew it was happening, but I didn't know the name. It's kind of like, you know, you have something wrong until the doctor tells you you have an ulcer. And then it's like, oh, yeah, that's what I have, you know. And so I'm learning more about parental alienation, but it's basically conditioning your children against you, you know. Um, mm -hmm. so, and it's, 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 there's different levels of it. But right now, like, you know, ha having been separated from them for so long and only seen them like on week, you know, once a month or something like that, they've learned to um, not need a dad. Maybe it's safer for them not to acknowledge me as a parent because their mom might, um, it might threaten their mom if they show loyalty towards me or whatever. I moved from Los Angeles to Salt Lake in the FBI in a child custody hardship transfer so I could have more time with them. And then when I got here, I was not allowed to see them as much still. And they, you know, they were becoming teenagers and they had friends and girlfriends, boyfriends and cars and jobs. And so they didn't really have time for me. Then when they did have time for me, they were scheduled to go see their aunt or go have dinner with their grandpa or something. So I, I wasn't on their list of things with their mom or, or with them themselves. And so it's it's been like, um, I'm still at a loss. And the reason I'm here and my my why for living so i i would like to live till i'm maybe 120 years old or further i want to maintain my body my spirit and my mind um sharp to an advanced age a really advanced age so i could be here for the marathon pace so i could have my hand outstretched for when my children decide yeah i could use a dad or i i need help with something or whatever when when i, I want to be here and i want to improve myself and be the best i could be so when they do need me that i'm ready and that, that that i could love them the way i you know to make up for this last you know it right. ha this happened in 2009 so it's not yeah. long long period of time but it's been yeah. over a decade and i want to be ready for when they're ready for me right and there's so many there's so many people in that such in that situation where the children are being used as pawns mm -hmm. in some jug, juggling control act between between parents but there's also parents who give up when when kids and and i know in our in the support group that i'm that i'm part of for the white collar group that's children relationship with children 
is a big discussion because children yeah. walk away from them. They're, you know, and so on. But it's like understanding that your life is a certain length of time and there's always an opportunity to reconnect. Sometimes it, it just takes some stones to get put in place, some stepping stones, and then they're ready. So it's kudos to you that you've, you've got that 120 plus year path and you're always open to having that come back in with you. Yeah, I have so, a um, I have a little uh, three by five court card pasted on my mirror upstairs in my bathroom, and I'll try to recite it. But it's a little poem from a talk that I heard at church, and it says, "Oh time, oh time, go back in flight. Let them be my little children for just one more night." And, cool. um, and, and underneath it says something. Like, it, the The point is, it's never too early. And it's never too late to lead and guide and walk beside your little children because um, families are forever. So right. that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. And you're showing them a great, uh, you're showing them a great path. So I'm going to, my next question is, I know that there's somebody listening to this interview and they've, they've Googled you a little bit and they've, they've heard your story now. And they're saying, if you're a behavioral analyst expert, why didn't you see what was wrong with the woman you married? And why did you get yourself into this position if you have that expertise? What do you say to that oh, person? Well, my expertise came like in, and I'm not an expert. I was assigned to the behavioral analysis unit. I didn't, I'm not Einstein or whatever, but that was just my job at the FBI for a, a couple of years towards the end of my career. That started in like 2016 or 17 or whatever it was. So um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, like I'm my own best client for life coaching, because if I had this figured out, you and I, I wouldn't even be here. I'd be happy We're surrounded by children and like all the, you know, everything would be good. But I went through hell. I put myself through hell and I was no expert at anything. You know, like I said, I couldn't learn anything as a dyslexic. So I just fumbled through life. I don't know why they let me in the FBI. They let me in and I got in and um, I just tried to fake it till I made it, you know. And that's kind of how I survived. So yeah, that's what I would say. Like we all have something. Everyone has something. I, I'm not trying to uh, dismiss or minimize my my guilt or whatever I've done or or portray myself as a genius or anything like that. Um, it's just my my path, and we all have different paths, you know. And sometimes we survive them, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we succumb. Um, but I was able, by some miracle to learn the coaching life coaching techniques along with the, all the other things. I think God has, has definitely sustained me. He's been in my life every step of the way and he's given me a path to help myself and also to run back into the fire to help other people suffering the same way I am. So that is yeah. super. You actually just answered my next question. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm <laughs> trying to answer all of them. I'm trying to guess what all your questions are. Okay. <laughs> Well, if you can guess all what all my questions are, then you have another career happening. Yeah. I feel <laughs> um, like the circus. Okay, so in one of your interviews, you talk about the FBI as being a brand, and I just this is one thing I just want to sort of get out there because we and for the guys that I know in the white collar group, you are like the polar opposite of them because they're you are the most hated because they're the guys you're the FBI is the guys that that stopped their life took their freedom away and for you you describe the FBI in a little bit differently as a as a brand can you share a little bit about that without well, and, I mean, and they, they do they have a job they have a they have a role none of this is meant to yeah. So I, I mean, the th first thing I would say as an argumentative, angry person, I would say, well, I didn't I didn't put you in jail or I didn't ruin your life. You ruined your life because no one ruined my life except for me. You know, like my mental issues and my decisions, my addictions, my um, lust and all that stuff. So, you know, one th like for healing, we have to like the, the first step um, in the 12 step program is to admit that your life has become unmanageable and you know, you are powerless to overcome your problems. So if I keep blaming everyone else, I'm going to stay where I'm at and still 
keep blaming people. You know, it's no one's fault, but your own. I think that's a great part of healing. That was part of my healing is like, it's no one else's fault, but my own. Secondly, I think just talking about the FBI. Yeah. It's a, it's a great brand. Like how awesome is it that I got to be an FBI agent, you know, to put on that. I used to love like just wearing the, the blue jacket with the FBI on it and just carrying a shotgun standing in the middle of the, of the street, like holding a print. It was like really cool. You know, I, I got to drive around when, when I was, I was part of the um, attorney general protective detail. We would drive around in the black SUVs, tinted windows with the windows down and like suits and the little ear thing and machine guns and making eye contact with everyone and uh, driving to the white house and stuff. It was, it was pretty surreal, you know? So um, yeah, it, it's a good brand. There's great people there, really great people, but there's also some really bad people there and it's a bureaucracy and it's uh, some somewhat dysfunctional in some cases. They, they do great work, but there's also some room for improvement. <laughs> Like, like any big organization, I, I remember when I first, and I'm not naive, but I'm, Can I'm Canadian. It never actually crossed my mind that the guys in the blue jackets with the FBI on their back were actually the guys that went to arrest people. We don't have that in Canada. The RCMP doesn't show up on their horses and their red, ja their red jackets. The, the local Calgary police show yes. up they're like i'm in downtown calgary there's the police everywhere it's yeah. just we don't have that presence so yeah, i, I just the, the way to... yeah the way i also i'm sorry to interrupt but the no, way no. i also looked at um the bad guys like i remember uh, putting handcuffs on a guy and uh, you know he was a, a public figure he was a city council member or whatever and uh, or just what, whoever it was like they deserved compassion you know I had a guy one time who, um, he was a police officer. He had to be arrested. So we, we arrested him, handcuffs on him. I was putting him in my van. He's like, and he knew the process. He's like, oh man, I'm not going to eat. You know, I'm going to go to jail. I'm not going to eat till tomorrow probably. Cause the, you know, he knew the booking process and this, and then the meal schedule and all this stuff. And so, um, I said, okay, I'm going to give you my lunch. And so I, I, he had handcuffs on and I was feeding him whatever I would, I forgot what I, maybe a sandwich or something like that. Then I gave him a drink and gave him some snacks and like, just tried to feed him and stuff. And I, so I just like the way I felt with people, um, that I was arresting is like, I had done worse things in my life than someone committing some kind of fraud for money. You know, like in biblical times, I would have been stoned to death for the, the things I did. And the, you know, and I, that wasn't, that was the, the only bad thing I've done. I I'm a sinner. I've done bad things throughout my life, you know, like who knows? And these guys were at the wrong place at the wrong time and they got caught. So why am I better than them? They're my brothers and sisters and they just made bad decisions. That doesn't define them. Cause I, and especially being from a place where I was so human, I was excommunicated from my church. I was ostracized. My friends turned against me. Um, you know, I lost my kids and like, I felt like, yeah, I had done some pretty bad things too, you know, so I yeah. deserve, you know. You so know. you had, a, you, that's, that's where your empathy comes in is yeah. that you could, un, you could understand a little bit more. And that's, cause that's nice to hear because it, it, it tempers that, that bad boy, you know, uncaring, cold FBI image because we yeah, know. And I, I really disdain that. I, I really despise the, um, that you know, a lot of people have an ego. Some people get into law enforcement or places, positions of power like that so they can mistreat other people. And it was really, uh, I really enjoyed having the compassion part of it. Um, uh, like to say, hey, I, I know what you did. I, I don't judge you. We're just, this is my job or whatever. One time we went to, um, we were in Los Angeles and we were trying to get some uh, MS-13 drug dealer. And uh, so we went to his house. He wasn't there but we still had to search the house. There was a bunch of us, you know, we have guns and helmets and body armor and all this stuff. And his dad and brother were there. So we went inside and we did our search and, um, and then the dad was diabetic and the brother had to help him out of bed and give him a shot and treat him and stuff. And so I, we helped, we helped him treat the dad and we said, can we help you? And we were nice to him and stuff. And you know, it was an FBI squad that I was with all FBI agents. And they said, you know, we've been, this is like the seventh time that law enforcement has come into the house and it was a different agency that would come the other time. And they said they weren't, they're, they're not nice to us ever. They throw our stuff on the ground. They treat us like dogs and they're not even the bad guys. They, this was the brother and dad. 
and right. th so they thanked us for you know being nice to them and you know one one bad guy thanked me for letting him loosen his handcuffs and feeding him and the other you know like i said the other guy fed him and stuff like that so i love being compassionate i love um treating people like humans and i um, I think that's lacking in a lot of law enforcement. Some of the work I do as a private investigator now is on the defense side of people who are wrongly accused by law enforcement. It's tragic. It's it's an injustice and it needs right. to stop. It's not part of this. So system. that's a good segue into, I wanted to ask you about your, um, your two years of, uh, in the missionary work in Mexico City. How did that, how does that inform what you do today? Tell, what was that experience like? So yeah, it was it was a privilege, and I've always been kind of like I like adventure, and like I wanted to go work in a on one of those. Uh, in high school, a lot of people would go work in Alaska on those like fishing boats or you know what process. I I wanted to do something awesome, and um, and so I was kind of drawn to that stuff. I wanted to be a missionary before I even wanted to join the church, and so. Um, I joined the church and I had the privilege. I saw my friends go off to their missions. One went to Micronesia, to Guam. One went to Connecticut. Another guy went to Arkansas. And, you know, they were going all, and people were going all over the place. So I submitted my mission request papers and I got a mission call. And you don't know where you're going until you open the envelope. And so you open it and it said Mexico City. And so my heritage is Mexican. My parents both spoke Spanish, um, but no one's from Mexico. They're all from Texas back into the 1800s, you know. I was the first person in my family to go to Mexico. Basically, my job was to help people. So we'd wake up every day and see how we can help people. And we, our primary tool was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, one of our church leaders named Gordon B. Hinckley said, our job is to make bad men good and good men better. <laughs> So That's we a just good mantra. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we would go and just try to do good all day and um, teach people about the gospel of Jesus Christ and bring them to to Christ through baptism. And that's our particular niche, whether people agree or don't. But um, uh, yeah, it, what the church taught me, it, it, I mean, the reason I joined the church in the first place is I always imagined having children. And I started, I became familiar with friends of mine who were members of the church, this group in high school, they all kind of stuck together. And I was part of all the different groups, you know, at different points. And when I would hang out with these guys, they would go home and it was weird because they were like friends with their parents. They got along with their parents, which I didn't do very well. They were, they were friends with their siblings. Like they were all together as friends. And I, I didn't know that life either. And it just felt very warm and accepting and safe. And so I remember thinking, I would like to marry a girl from this church because I would like my kids to grow up this way. But I never thought about joining myself. And then I was able to join and um, I kind of felt like drawn into it somehow through some, by the grace of God, of course. So I, I joined and I became a missionary and it was the best, joining the church was the best thing that ever happened to me. And being a missionary really taught me a lot more about compassion. It taught me more about like how to, you know, like you and I, live better than most people in the history of mankind you know with our carpets and with our refrigerators and stuff like that so it gave me a little bit of empathy about how other people live and what they sacrifice just to come to our countries to make a little bit of money to send back to places that are broken or where people have yeah. awful situations and stuff. It's always, I'm a, I'm a big traveler and I'm a third by, I have a passion for third world countries so it's always eye-opening and refreshing when you go to countries and not that Mexico City is a third world country but there are certain facets of Mexico oh, City that, definitely that, yeah the, the shanty towns are, and, yeah. yeah it gives you a good perspective and you know two year two years there that's 720 days of full immersion of doing good for people yeah what better that's like a master class in, in being human yeah, and then, I mean, you definitely, you have a companion you're supposed to be with 24-7, like never part ways from this person, like, and so you get different companions, but it's, it, you know, I guess it, it's a good relationship help trainer because you, you're you with someone who may not like you very much, you know, um, but you have to deal with it somehow and, yeah, um, yeah, it's you, good. You you figure it out. Yeah. So I want to go back a little bit to your um, your personal story. 
you described uh, life behind your front door when you walked into your front door and you took off your stuff as terror that was way worse than what you saw at work. Can you kind of give perspective to what emotional abuse and abuse by your wife looks like? Because I think that's one of the areas there's, I've done some research, there's six, uh, at least 60% of men in the world that have suffered a, some traumatic type abuse at the hands of their, the woman in the, the woman in their life. And, and, and that's kind of shocking because men typically are bigger, more physical than women and, and so on. But it doesn't look the same as men's abuse to women. Right. So, so it's not physical, it's psychological, which I don't know. I don't know which is worse, but I wish I didn't have either. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, as there was times where, I mean, she would like just little things like, you know, I'd get on the phone with my children in Utah and she would make little snide remarks like, oh, they're up they're They're still awake. They should be in bed or like little things like that, like little jabs, like, oh, and like, I didn't feel like comfortable even talking about it there. And, you know, you, you, we've all been in these situations where it's like, oh, don't bring this up or maybe I shouldn't like, and it was kind of like a divide and looking back on it, she did not want me to have a relationship with my kids. That's I, plain and simple. So all these little efforts, all the psychological stuff and all the manipulation, um, she would say, um, you know, don't come home today or I'm going to call the police and tell them you raped me yesterday or something like that. And I'd be like, oh, or, um, you know, don't come home. All your stuff's going to be out on the front lawn. And I, you know, like in LA, like it's, you're like an hour and a half away from home, you know, even though it's 30 miles away or whatever. Um, so just things like that. One time I went to work and my two children were here for the summer and in, in California were with me in California. And she said, I'm going to leave your children home. And then I'm going to call the police and tell them that you are neglecting them and stuff. And so I'm like, Oh, like, I didn't, I didn't know. I don't. And I had to learn all this, the domestic laws and like all these, I didn't know what was the, that this was domestic abuse or that this was um, emotional abuse or neglect, or I didn't know any, all the labels. All I did was go to work and do my, job you know i didn't i didn't i'm not an expert on, on all that stuff but it was very just you know that like i said that pit in my stomach that fear all the time was always there and intimidation and um you know unhappiness screaming just discord and stuff like that with a little bit of joy and happiness and euphoria with peppered in to keep me going back you know and so yeah, it was definitely afraid. I, one time I, you know, through all this, I called the LA County Sheriff's domestic violence hotline one time. And I told them, I said, Hey, I'm not your typical caller. I'm an FBI agent. I carry a gun. I know how to kill people. I train in defensive tactics, you know, you know all this, all this stuff, you know, I'm the last guy who you would think would call the domestic violence hotline. And I just said, I'm afraid that something's going to happen one day where there's someone's going to wrestle for my gun and someone's going to end up with it and pull a trigger and one the person on the other end is going to go away either me or her and uh, or or anything below that you know like I, I and they and i went to my internal security office at the fbi and told them what was going on and they said well just lock up everything your laptops your guns everything put it in the trunk of your fbi car and then take your keys and put them in a safe so she doesn't have access. She would take my keys sometimes. And, you know, I don't want to make this all about ripping on her or anything. But no, just, but you know, I, um, you know, it was it was scary. It was it was traumatic. And then I mean, it was bad for me. Imagine my little children coming to visit and then this happening to them. And then my ex-wife knowing that this is like I'm sending my children to be abused at the hands of this, of my ex-husband. And so no wonder they've turned against me, you know, like it's just, it's, um, it wasn't a good situation. It wasn't good to put them in that. And it wasn't good for any of the children. And it was, yeah. uh, there's a, so eventually what happened, it was, uh, one of the turning points in my life. Another turning point aside from joining the church and leaving the FBI, this was, um, one, I went to training after a really bad situation happened in my home one time, like where, I, you know, one of the few times that I had left, packed up my stuff and left. It was a, it was a New Year's Eve incident where um, one of many where I left and came back and left and came back. And, but um, this time um, my, there was an incident where she got really upset with my son and she has, she 
was constantly upset with him. And um, it kind of just blew up. I packed up my things and I left. But during this incident, I put on my GoPro camera and she was acting out violent and she broke a guitar and she was trying to go for my gun case. And I, that was a no-no. I, I wrestled her for the keys to my gun case because I didn't want her to get access to whatever was inside. You know, it was, it was just really a bad situation. And so I left and then um, I went to work and I didn't know, and I left with my two older children. And every time I left, she said, you're never going to see these little boys again, my two younger children. She said, you're, and she'd say things like, they're going to be raised to hate you and, you know, all this stuff, all these threats. And it was overwhelming. And so I left and I went to work and at work at the FBI, we have continual training. They call them virtual academy trainings. And, you know, they teach you about what, what to do when you're flying armed or how to process evidence or how to deal with victims. You have crimes, like it's the whole gamut, you know? And so this training popped up and it said, you're required to take this training and the training's called how to recognize and report uh, suspected child abuse. And so I was like, okay, let's do it. So I got on the training and I, it's very clear to me what sexual abuse and physical abuse is, but then they had this whole section on emotional abuse and like bullet by bullet, I said, oh my gosh, this is happening in my home. Oh my gosh, this is happening. This is happening. And this is, and so, and this is like the, the federal government telling us the mandates about um, emotional abuse. And so I was, I became very exhilarated. I finished the training. I got off the phone and I called the EAP who I had mentioned previously, the, the psychologists and the people who were there to help us. And I called them and I said, Hey, I just took this training and everything in this training regarding emotional abuse are things happening in my home and I need to report it. I need help. And this is going on. And so long story short, they pursued it. They called the department of children and family services in Los Angeles. They did an investigation. They did psyche valves on me and her and they just interviewed people and then they ultimately resulted in giving her a removal order. Um, they told her, you can't have access to your kids. So she lost six kids one day. She had four from a previous marriage, two with me, and then of course my two other ones in Utah. So we had eight all together. And um, she, she, didn't, she couldn't have her kids anymore. And so it was hard and tragic. I remember a quote from John F. Kennedy because I had tried, you know, obviously you try, ask, please don't get mad. Please stop yelling. Please don't mm -hmm. be mad. Please be nice to my kids. John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful change impossible make violent change inevitable. And that might be the case with some of the people, you know, in white collar crimes or whatever, you know, like we, we, you know, we, we go down this path and something happens and we cannot undo the consequences that come. And, you know, I don't like what happened. But that, that is, um, thank you so much. I know that's not easy to share that. And we want to be respectful of the other, the other people involved, but I think it's important for people to hear that this is a real thing and this goes on in people's lives and, and uh, so on. So, and it's tough as a man, because especially, especially when you have guns and stuff is that, the level of impulse restraint and impulse management from wanting to physically react to that and so on is astronomical because you know that you're, you're stronger than the woman in most cases and women fight nasty. They, they fight with nails, nails, words, words, and they bite. Yeah. That's, that's what they, that's what they do. So I don't want to belabor any more on that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really do. How do you use life coaching with yourself? Because obviously you've had lots of opportunities to use life coaching with yourself. What do you, what's your, what's your go-to? How's it changed your, your life? So how do I use life coaching in my life? There's two tools that I um, learned from Brooke Castillo, my guru, um, that I, that I do for myself. And then it's basically everything I teach my clients. Um, <clears throat> and so the, just to preface this, it, the way I talk to people, it's kind of like, um, do you know what slack lining is like walking on a tight rope? Type yeah, yeah. Yep. So I tell people I could teach you everything you need to know about slack lining in about um, 60 seconds, but it'll take you like I'm on my fourth season of slack lining. I still can't do it. You know, oh, yeah? <laughs> you're still 
you're still developing. So I can teach you the basics, but it's going to be up to you to, um, to, to practice it. And that's why I work with people for three months to a year to, or beyond to, um, to work with them one-on-one -on -one to, to reestablish this. But so um, two things you can do or three things actually um, every day that help me is a thought download. And the thought download is basically like taking a junk drawer in your kitchen. You have all kinds of weird stuff. The first thing you do to organize that junk drawer is to empty it out. And when you empty it out, then you could reorganize. Okay, I have some pencils, I have staples, I could get rid of all this junk that I don't need, and you could organize it better. So a thought download is kind of like making a grocery list. You write, you wake up, and we always have thoughts. We wake up in the middle of the night, going to the bathroom, we have tons of thoughts. We wake up in the morning, tons of thoughts. Throughout the day, we have tons of thoughts. You know, and it's kind of causes us some anxiety or worry or fear or whatever. So when we do that, we just write down everything. You know, I'm worried about paying my rent. How am I going to pay my rent? Um, I need to get my oil changed. I have a dentist appointment coming up or my kids need this. It's back to everything that comes out in our mind. We do a thought download and then we take the thoughts. The next thing we do and, and you could spend your whole life doing this or you could spend, you know, a couple minutes in the morning. The next thing we do or what I do is I take a thought that's bothering me and then I put it into something called a thought model. And the thought model is basically um, five components, and it's a circumstance, and we and we teach that circumstance leads to thoughts. So that's the second thing, which is the thought I'm that's bothering me, and then um, the the thoughts lead to feelings, and the feelings lead to actions, and the actions lead to results. And so we put that in the model, and it's um, basically we try to figure out what our thoughts are doing to us. You know, some thoughts like uh, I, I have had the privilege of working with people on weight loss. And this is a very, the reason I bring this up is because it's measurable and you can kind of see the difference or whatever in weight loss or whatever. So um, let's say someone gets on the scale and their circumstance is 300 pounds. You know, the, and that's a fact. The circumstance that's a fact, is a fact. right. It, it triggers a thought. The thought that it triggers is, Sometimes, like, I'm just making this up, but from what, what other people have told me, they say, I'm a fat slob, you know, and when you, when you think the thought, I'm a fat slob, like, if you and I just think that for a second, what feeling does that give us? That gives us a feeling of disgust or despair or overwhelm or whatever. It gives us a negative feeling when you think, well, we could all think that I'm a fat slob. And then it just makes us feel like just horrible, you know? And then what is, and we could imagine this scenario if we had a video camera inside this person's house, what does the person who feels um, disgusted do? They go to that, you're, you're right in front of a refrigerator. They open that refrigerator. They get some Ben and Jerry's and some potato chips. And then they go sit in front of the couch and then they, they sit in front of the TV and put on Netflix and just wallow in their, you know, eat their, their, been their, there. Yeah. <laughs> We, we all do weird stuff like that. And so that's just one, one aspect. Um, and so the result, so that's the action in the, in the thought model. Then the next step is the result. What's the result that that guy's going to get? They're going to either maintain that weight or gain more, and then they're just going to continue to be unhealthy. But if we can teach them, like, like see what that's doing to you, and then we do another thought model and say, how do you want to think about that, the 300 pounds? When the, when the circumstance pops up, what do you want to think about it? And, um, and they, you know, sometimes people think I could weigh 170 pounds again. And if you think that thought, I could weigh 170 pounds again, what feeling does that give you? That gives you a feeling of hope maybe, or enthusiasm or something like that. And, um, that positive feeling drives positive actions. So that makes them want to keep the refrigerator closed, maybe go for a walk, or eat some salad or drink some more water. It, it, it gives them positive actions. And then the result is related to their thought. I could, I could weigh 170 pounds again. You that know, is so. just so, that's so simple. Nothing changes. Circumstance is exactly the same. The yeah. fact, the reality is the same. It's just taking a different thought and then yeah. it drives so, a different so I, I mean, I could work with someone in one session. You know, this is someone who, who like, for instance, I had a guy who had a, you know, for three decades, he was struggling with his relationship. He's been married 36 years or something like that. And he said, it's been bad for basically three decades. And you work with them and just show them what their thoughts are doing to them and what, how it's, your thoughts are creating your results 
ultimately. And if you could just change your thoughts a little bit, how you start getting different results. And like just in one session, like you could see people just opening up and, and it's kind of like a tool. Like I said, it's like learning how to walk a slack line. You're not, you, you, I could teach you the tools, but it's like doing it over and over and over. You're, cause you're retraining your brain. You're retraining your neuro pathways. It's like learning to walk again. And mm -hmm. once I stay with you and help coach you learning to walk again, you're going to take off. And so and you do uh, that and you do that for yourself, right? You use the same day, thing every day. And, and, and it's kind of like putting on a lens, like, a, you know, like you've seen those, videos where people put on the lenses where they could see color all of a sudden when they when they're colorblind and it's like your whole world opens up you see things differently and then you start thinking what you start picturing what other people's thought models are you know what are they probably thinking like the guy who just yelled at me at starbucks like he's probably thinking this and he's probably feeling this way and his actions are and these are you know so you kind of it gives you a little bit more empathy you know the 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 branding I'm using now primarily because I'm seeing a lot of people come to me, especially with like the pandemic stuff or whatever. They're isolated. They're afraid. They don't know who to believe. They don't know what their politics are all different. People, families are being divided. Um, you know, a, a byproduct from the pandemic is the suicide rate has raised. Um, domestic violence rates, if you talk oh, to me, sure. they're going bonkers right now. Um, and then just uh, the, the other things like people are eating, people are drinking too much, people are taking drugs, people are trying to self-medicate themselves out of this, the stuff you and I have all done to um, try to feel better. So I, I see a lot of parallels in one of my roles at the FBI, which is as a tactical medic. The, the way I look at it is as a, you know, I was trained in tactical combat casualty care. I was an EMT. I was there to treat people in tragic situations or whatever. The way it looks is, so I have a little first aid kit. All the, um, all the operators carry one of these and uh, police officers, um, military people carry one on themselves. And it's very, it's not complicated. As you see, this could help you save your life. It's simple tools. You employ them on yourself or you, or, or I run to help um, um, treat people with them, but I'm also providing training. So they treat themselves. And it's very, it's a lot of parallels to care under fire. When the bullets are flying, you know, you have a medic with you that treats you, but you also receive training when the bullets aren't flying. So you could take care of yourself. You could put on a tourniquet, you could stop your bleeding. You could, you, uh, you know, um, you could take care of yourself. So I feel like, you know, this mind medic brand that I'm trying to create, uh, that I'm trying to develop within my life coaching has a lot of parallels to this combat medicine, um, you know, because I'll run into the fight with you. I will when bullets are flying, because that's the way we feel sometimes. That's the way I felt. You know, I will treat your wounded mind. I will help you because um, you're wounded and you're helpless and you're isolated and there's fear, all those things. And then I'm also going to, I'm going to stay with you long enough. So you learn how to treat yourself. You know, unfortunately not everyone makes it, you know, <laughs> there's, there's yeah. casualties. Um, but there's, there are a few people out there who are sick and tired of feeling this way and they want to try something new. And that's where right. I, I offer. And you're not always, and, that, and that's a great analogy the the, the medic, because you're not always there with them. You know, no. it's great to say there's a 24 hour helpline and so on, but the reality is if you've got those tools to patch yourself up, if you get if if you get a hypothetical bullet wound to your thinking to your thinking, if you have the tools to be able to remediate that, to to stop the that, that just makes you that makes you so much more powerful for you. Yeah. So that so is it's not that about is, it's not about getting, you know it's not about getting you hooked on working with me and then I'm going to be with you and drain your money or I work with you and I treat you and then I teach you how to treat yourself. And the, the way I describe the thought model is very simple, you know, the five components of thought download and then, and then, and we build on that of course, and learn all kinds of psychology together and stuff like that and, and ruin and, and um, work it in your life. It's very simple. The tools are very simple as are the tools in combat medicine, you know, tourniquet, um, chest seals, um, wound packing stuff, a very, very finite set of things. And in the, like, just as a, you know, when I worked in the FBI as a tactical EMT, we'd go to these operations and sometimes we'd have doctors with us and they would tell us like everything that we can do in the field, 
we're not going to do anything more than you can do. Like, you know, a medic, picture a doctor's office or a sur surgical center or a trauma room. They have all these different devices and stuff, but they would tell us all we're going to do is the things in this bag. We're going to stop the bleeding. We're going to keep an airway open and we're going to transport We're you know, keep them warm and do a few little things. And if we can do those few things in our lives, in our, in our mind, um, we're going to be able to survive and thrive and treat ourselves. And then what I love is when my clients teach this to other people, because they say mm -hmm. teaching is learning twice over. And so I have clients who are like calling their family members or teaching them the thought model or teaching them, you know, teaching their kids and stuff like that. And it's amazing. That's fantastic. So it sounds to me like full-time life coach, that's your, that's your path over the next little while. Yes. Um, and we know that building a business is not as easy as selling lemonade and snow cones <laughs> on your front lawn, although we wish it was, <laughs> wish it was. So what's the, what's the big goal? Where can we, what do we see, expect to see from you over the next five years? I just want to keep doing this. I want to coach full right now. I have my side hustles. I'm a private investigator and trying to, you know, make make ends meet and support my kids and do my yeah thing. that's a challenge eh? we got to make it we've got to make ends meet yeah so in a nutshell what would you say from your whole story what is the biggest lesson that you've learned the biggest lesson is that we don't have to give up i think i'll need some time to think about that but i think that's you know there's always hope and um yeah. i i think let me develop this for a couple of seconds. But I think the biggest lesson um, is that I could think whatever I want to think today and I could feel however I want to feel today. And that's a real thing. Um, and it's and it's everything we do in life is because of a feeling that we have, whether it's good or bad, like whether we choose to, you know, uh, a lot of sicknesses we have are lifestyle driven, you know, lung cancer, throat cancer, or whatever, um, or because of our environment or whatever, um, or the relationships we have, all the results that we have are because of the thoughts we we have, the houses we live in, the children we have, it, it all originated with a thought. So if we could use our thought like a lightsaber in Star Wars, you know, we could do, <laughs> we can do some great things. We could use it. That is a fantastic visual. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to see that. So, so how do you think men can, I got just a couple more questions as we go. I've got two more. How do you think men can start supporting men better? I think the best thing we can do, and I look at this, you know, like again, the, the medic, the mind medic thing, like we're in battle, like whether it's the COVID or politics or whatever we are, we're fighting our own health or relationships. We're in kind of like a war zone sometimes. And sometimes we feel that way. I think the best thing we can do training up an army, you know, <laughs> is to um, train ourselves up to get ourselves fit and sharp and strong and prepared. And, and it doesn't mean physically. I mean, it could mean physically that's important too. But our minds need to be sharp. Our minds need to be not cowering, and we not we need to you know put on this armor. They talk about the armor of God in the Bible, you know, uh, with the helmet and with the breastplate and with weapons and with boots and stuff like that. And we do the same thing in the FBI, and people are doing it in the military, and we can do that with our minds just to shore up the weaknesses that we have and to annihilate them and to learn how to manage them. And they're going to come there. I'm not done being afflicted or overwhelmed or hurt in my life, but I, but I could handle them differently now when they come. Perfect. That's actually the end of my question. So, so we did really well considering I had four pages, four pages yeah. of them. So I want to just wrap up, wrap up a bit. A good friend of mine said, that the only person that can steal your freedom is you in the choices that you make. And I really want everyone who's listening to really get that because you've been talking about this all the way through. It's all about the choices that you make, what you think about those thoughts, how those thoughts make you feel and, and so on. So I actually asked Roman to be a guest for very personal reasons as he, as he knows, but I hope each of you get that no matter what's going on in your life, there is someone out there that can help you. 
So taking the first step is simply just making another choice. So with that, where can people find you, connect with you, get yeah, more of Roman Garcia? Yes, you can get me. Um, you could send me a message or um, I do free consultations for life coaching. And I'm also starting a group coaching program. Um, so you could contact me at mind-medic.com and by email at roman, R-O-M-A-N, at mind dash medic dot com perfect and we'll get that and you're on instagram too i think right yes okay so we'll get we'll get all your information we'll get it in the show notes so if uh someone and i know that there's a hand at least a handful of people that that will be clamoring at the bit to get a hold of you and get get talking a bit so thank you so much for being here for this for this interview i know we had a few little in, internet connection things which joy of editing is going to get get rid of those things <laughs> thank goodness super enjoyable learned lots more about you than i already did so thank you very much for being here roman thank you guys are you as excited as me after listening to roman and you just can't wait to share the episode well we've got a special treat for you this plus two more crazy powerful interviews all on video, along with some live training with me in our Bounce Back Entrepreneur series. Get exclusive front-of-the-line access. Just head on over to our central home on the web, debbiecolburn.com forward slash links forward slash and drop your email in to open up the all-access viewing page. Again, that's debbiecolburn, D-E-B-B-I-E-C-O-L-B-O-U-R-N dot com forward slash links forward slash and have the most amazing week.